All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In. We're here to recap an exciting time in the tennis calendar. The Miami Open is officially in the rear view. We're onto the clay. Uh, got from a journalist now from Tennis Now. You can find him on Twitter at the Fan Child is his handle. He's been covering the game as thorough and as disciplined as anyone. Uh, Chris Otto joins the show. Chris, always a pleasure. A lot to recap since our last chat, but excited to have you back on the podcast. Good to be back, Mitch. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm I'm doing well, and it's kind of melancholy, right? Because we look forward to different sections of the tennis year. This was like section two. You had your big Aussie Open push, summer down under, the sunshine double, uh, no time in the calendar like it. Indian Wells, Miami in the rear view, and a lot to di- dissect on the tennis court, Chris. But we also had, you know, a lot of interesting storylines on and off the court. We also had a lot of animals too, right? I mean, there was like snakes, bees, and different. You know, a hawk I think, in that last match. So, you know, it's good to see even the animals were enjoying tennis. I know. It was a crazy month, right? So much happened. You think bringing up, bringing up those bees at Indian Wells, what a surprise that was. It was a lot, and it shows you just how tennis really does captivate a lot of things. And, you know, I guess we can kind of start there. I wasn't playing on it, but there's more than just, there's always more right than just one player, one storyline. It's not just, and I'm not just saying this for the old guard that retires, the fetters, the Serenas that we all, like it's also the fact that there's more than just one top player. There's one than just one top match, one top storyline. Week in, week out, tennis just reminds you that there's so much drama and intrigue that it's going to be fine regardless of which players are in and out. That the game and the storyline just keep creating themselves. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you go under the radar a little bit, I mean, you know, it was it was big big times for Sinner and Alcaraz, and of course the Djokovic upset to Luka at Indian Wells. But there was like. So many other things I was tracking and enjoying in the the first, like, five or six days of that tournament. Tommy Paul was amazing to watch. Went on a really good run. He was kind of flying the flag for the Americans. There was a young Czech player, Jakob Mensik, who I had my eyes on. You know, you're right. There's just so many storylines, so much happening across the men's and women's side. And a whole full month of it, it's it's, it's a lot to take in. But I think it's it's a nice way to kind of segue into the clay, say goodbye to the hard courts for a while. You know, I think it was perfect. And we learned a lot, for sure. We did. Uh, And just to do some bookkeeping for fans of this show and uh, people that enjoy tennis chats and just marking sections in time, the last time we did a podcast, Chris, together was in December of last year, 2023. It was right after Italy won the Davis Cup on the back and on the racket of Yannick Sinner, who went through Novak Djokovic to do so. Uh, in the four months since then, four and a half, five months since then, Chris, he has undoubtedly been the best player in the world. We've seen it time and time again. He proved it in Miami. He's got one loss in 2024 to Carlos Alcaraz in arguably the best court suited for Alcaraz's game. Sinner bounces back from his first loss and dominates the field. He dismantled. Everyone in his path, including a very game and a very hot, at the time, Grigor Dimitrov. Yeah. Chris, Yannick Sinner is on another level. And we, it's funny, we were expecting a breakthrough. We knew he was in his moment. And yet he keeps exceeding expectations. This is a process-oriented young man who finds a way to get better incrementally. And we're seeing it, and we saw it yet again in Miami. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't even care about his results, it seems like. He's so even keel and so, like you said, focused on the process. He's gotten so much better as a server. He's gotten so much better in terms of his experience now playing in these big matches and now winning his second Masters 1000 title. It was kind of like, it just felt like really comfortable for him, especially bouncing back after what could have been a difficult loss at the hands of Carlos and at Indian Wells. Um He's just such a pro right now, and he's just really got his head focused on the on the right things, and he just keeps improving. I don't think he's really overthinking these victories, just like he doesn't overthink his losses. There's never been a top two Italian man before him, and he also exceeded twenty million on the prize money range, which is just to show you how this process has gone and how young he still is. But the last question was, as you said, right? Like, how is he going to handle a loss? How is he going to handle getting? you know, punch back, knocked off the perch a little bit by Alcaraz. Well, I responded by winning this tournament, and I brought up the ranking. Getting the number two in the world, getting above Alcaraz for the time being with number one in his sights, it's another, it's another milestone, it's another step, and it's something for a guy that's not satisfied to continue to add elements to his game. It's still, in a way, Chris, there's still room to improve, which sounds, you know, I, I would shudder to think about that if I was an ATP player. 
Yeah, apparently Darren Darren Kale saying Sunday there are a lot of areas for him to prove, improve. Getting to the net, still working on the serve, still working on the return, still wants to get more out of his backhand slice. But yeah, but but you think back to the loss to Alcaraz and and how he was able to just process that and get over it, and and he's just so reliable. It just comes back the next week and is virtually untouchable. Yeah, I want to give credit to the whole team. Obviously, Darren Cahill, uh, Simone Vengazi as well, uh, Vengazi as well, but also, and Cahill brought him up, the fitness coach, Umberto Ferreira, the work that he's put in, because we, I keep going back to it, we had these discussions, and they were fair critiques. Is he physical enough? Is he going to be able to withstand the brutal rigors of the modern-day men's tennis game, especially best of five? Well, he's passed every test in flying colors. But Chris, the point of the Darren Kale's statement that I really enjoyed was, he said, look, this is incremental. He knows that not only is this a process, but we're not going to build Rome in a day, pun intended. Mm -hmm. It's going to continually get stronger, but not rush things. So he's got everybody on board. Everybody is working in lockstep, knowing that it's going to take steps. It's going to be incremental. And we're seeing the rewards. This is not a flash in the pan success because he hasn't treated it as such. Yeah. Oh, look, he could, he could like slip back for the rest of the season. He could not even play the rest of the season. And you'd look and say, he won a slam. He won a master. He had a great year. He's broken, <laughs> breaking records for Italian players. Now he's number two in the world. No Italian has ever done that. No Italian's ever had 13 titles. So he's like rewriting the record books for his country on the heels of, as you mentioned, the Davis yeah. cup. And of course we could have, we did expect it and we should have because those kind of victories can really propel players forward. And that's, I guess it's worked to put some wind in Yannick's sails as well. And best is yet to come for sure. It might not come on the clay or at Wimbledon or even for the remainder of this year, but we know we're good to go, good to go with both Carlos and Yannick right now as, as far as the future of men's tennis. And those guys are going to be at the top. It looks like for a while. It definitely just sounds different, the ball coming off of his racket. He has, he uses that length that he has with that long wingspan and those long legs. And I also notice when you watch a guy like Yannick Sitter play, just how clean he strikes the ball, whether that's on a first serve, whether that's on just in the course of a rally. And he gets so much power now, and that's the difference is corner to corner. I heard Jim Courier say it, who knows much more than I do, mm -hmm. that corner to corner is where the biggest in in improvements of his game has happened. So... Full marks to Yannick Sinner wasn't tested too much. I do have to also say we should give thorough praise to what Grigor Dimitrov did. Not just oh. getting to the final, but going through Alcaraz, going through Hubie, going through Zverev. Zverev, a guy who's also owned him in recent memory. Yeah. Dimitrov's into the top 10. This is the best version of Dimitrov we've seen. And Chris, he's figured out a way to at least slow the aging process because he looks equally a bit as athletic as he did 10, 12 years ago. He looks so good for 32. He's still relatively young. I mean, compared to Novak Djokovic at 36 and Gael Monfils at 37, you think he's got room to go. And, and it's funny, his season is looking a lot like his 2017 season. Everything he seems to do this year, we revert back. Well, this is the first time he's done such and such a thing since 2017, but he might be a better player than he was then. He certainly got a lot more experience. And the thing I noticed is he's serving better and handling his serve better. I think he's winning 90% of his service games thus far this season, which is way above his career average. He's winning more first serve points, winning more second serve points. And that, I think, is making life a lot easier for him. Yeah, it's like that balancing act, right? Like you're picking up knowledge, you're learning how to be smarter, but your athleticism is going. And he's somehow steadying the ship, keeping the athleticism, but playing smarter, getting better on his serve, especially. That Alcaraz match was insane because there's a lot of times, you know, covering this sport where top players will lose to players that aren't ranked as high. Maybe the betting odds will have them as a prohibitive favorite. And a lot of times it's fair to say, while well, they just had an off day. They weren't themselves. We've seen it from Alcaraz in the past, too. That match was all about Dimitrov. Like, I, I didn't really take much out of Alcaraz not playing well. Dimitrov would have beaten anyone that day. No, I think uh, Carlos played a pretty good match against Dimitrov. There wasn't much he can do. And as he said so eloquently after the match, he felt like he was a 13-year-old. I mean, if there's any knock yeah. on Carlos is that you'd like to see a top player protect his serve a little bit more, not get broken so much. But but Grigor was just out of his mind in that match, as he was for so many of those matches at Miami and all year. He's 20-5 and five on the season now. And like he got the title in Brisbane. It's just wind in his sails since then. Really yeah. incredible. And just one of the coolest guys out there, most likable guys you're going to see, right? Yeah. And wins this year, Hubie, Zvera Valkra as this tournament, also also Holger to win that Brisbane title. So he's got some big wins there. I uh, I do think, too, and you look at Grigor, 
you mentioned 2017. I was thinking about this when you brought that up. He had a tough loss. He had that match against Nadal in NAO, ranked in the top five. Everything was good. Tough loss in Indian Wells, and then he just never got back on track. In Australia, he lost to Nuno Borges in a match that, you know, I watched that he could have won and didn't play well down the stretch. Mm. To see him bounce back, maybe the other little thing about Grigor being different is that he had a bad loss in a major, but that hadn't seemed to phase him at this point. Yeah, a little more resilient, a little more positive. Just enjoying the game, it seems like, you know, just really seems to be enjoying his life on tour. And you can't say that for all these guys. It's a grind for them all the time. So just tons of positive energy. And I think he's happy to be carrying the flag for the one hat backhand, put it back in the top yeah. 10 again this week. And everybody's like loving on that. So it's, yeah, it's good, it's good vibes all around. Hope he can carry it onto the clay. I know he needed that. The one hand backhand guys were, were having to, having a meeting. They needed a representative. <laughs> in the first step up. Well, you know, looking at the other players that went into the final weekend, uh, Daniil Medvedev had, you know, again, another deep run has established himself as a top four player in the world, top three, given where Djokovic is. But that was the most frustrated, Chris, I think I've ever seen him on the tennis court. It was almost like an existential crisis. And we, we just waxed poetically about how good Sinner is. But you've seen Medvedev lose. You've seen him on the short end of the stick, even against Nadal and against Djokovic and matches even against Kyrgios. But that was like an existential crisis where you could see him questioning decisions and not sure what to do against Sinner. I know there's a lot to be said about how well Sinner's played, but Medvedev now has lost five straight to him and we'll have to go back to the drawing board. Yeah. Then Daniel didn't have a great serving day either. And I think there's a lot of things that are frustrating him. You know, he's been unable to defend a title now. What is it? Like 20 different times he's come around and had a chance to defend a title. And I think Miami thinks it's a good chance for him. Whereas when he lost the final to Alcaraz in Indian Wells, he's more able to consider that as like, oh, this is Carlos's best surface. There's not much I can do against him. But in Miami, he's kind of expecting to play better on a faster surface against a guy who he won his first six matches against. Mm -hmm. And now the flip, the, the script has been completely flipped and he's lost five straight to center. And it looks like it's hard to even imagine him winning after what we saw in Miami. So, yeah, I can see why he's frustrated. He's kind of running into the wall against these two young guys, and they're going to make it a lot harder for him to win Grand Slam number two, right? Yeah, I had that thought, and I, I put it out online, and, and I got some feedback on it. But I can't remember a rivalry flipping this fast. Like, rivalries have flipped over time, but it's also hard to play someone five times in a calendar year because yeah. it was. Mevita was 6-0 and after last year's Miami against center, and now he's 6-5. and So... There was some good feedback like Federer and Albandi and Federer Hewitt, but again, it just wasn't quite as fast. And that's just a product of blind luck of seeing a guy this many times. Yeah, and a product of uh, Yannick's so, so rapid improvement because Medvedev, let's face it, has been playing great, pretty, pretty much to the top of his potential for most of this season. But Yannick is just growing so quickly, and that's, that's more proof of it right there, isn't it? Well, if Medvedev's only title that he defends ends up being the Rome one, that'll be hilarious. Like, that'd be the funniest. I'd <laughs> most love to see it. Bring it off, Daniel. Horrible thing ever. <laughs> uh, the, other, the other semifinalist who lost in that match, uh, his match to Grigor Alex, Alexander Zverev. Chris, it was a, another good run in a tournament, but the common theme for Sasha has been tough losses deep in events. And, you know, dare I say, and I think he would agree, winnable matches. So he's recovered nicely physically from the injury and I don't know if it's mental or I don't know if it's just not being 100% there and being 97% there but why do you think Zverev keeps having this issue of great runs but tough winnable matches going by the wayside yeah you know I don't know he's you know he's he's been dangerous I think we talked about him going into Australia as one of the one of the non big three name favorite kind of guys and he's he's been solid all season but yeah he keeps running into the wall against players he really got flattened by by Alcaraz so Maybe that does a little bit to his confidence. Maybe he just doesn't believe in himself in these situations yet. I mean, he's, he's given himself chances, and you got to give him credit for that, right? Yeah, it's, it's odd because with Medvedev, you thought, okay, this is somebody that maybe has had a hold on him, like he's beaten him before. And even though he did outplay him for most of that match at Australia, there's still the lingering doubt of, like, can I actually do it in a big match with this guy? Dimitrov wasn't that case. He's, you know, hadn't beaten him in like seven tries. So that was a frustrating thing. I, I do think going to the clay is going to be helpful for him. Yeah. I think, and, and, you know, not to preview all my French Open and Roland Garros, run to Roland Garros thoughts, but given the uncertainty with certain players on the clay, I think Zverev could easily be a top four, maybe even top three player on this surface this spring. 
Yeah, he's a real yeah. grinder. He makes it hard on his opponents. He's got great shot tolerance. He he can he can really grind out and get you into those long matches that guys just hate to be in. And that's what he's so good at. But, you know, you're right. He's been coming up short in a lot of big opportunities. And I'm kind of sort of expecting a breakthrough from him. And maybe it's just a matter of uh it's just a matter of time for Sasha to do something pretty big, maybe get back to a, you know, a slam final or something like that. I think he has it in him. Mm -hmm. Still again, super young. Well, Last thing before we switch it over to the women's side of things in Miami, how do you think Carlos Alcaraz will respond, Chris, to now being passed in the ranking by Yannick Center? There's still obviously so much to like about where Alcaraz is and what he can still do, but now if Center has that number one ahead of him. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's good. It'll get the competitive juices flowing. I think that Indian Wells is incredibly important for Alcaraz. He came in there. A little bit hangdog, a little bit low on confidence, worried about the ankle injury and kind of shed a lot of his worries. Proved that he can do good in, in a, on a surface and in conditions that are favorable to him. I think that'll help him for the clay. I think he believes that he's in there with a shot against Sinner. He, he believes that they're like rivals that are head to head and going to, you know, going to each give lumps to each other and each take lumps from each other. I think he's got confidence that he can get back and win more slams this year. So I think. I feel like, you know, Miami notwithstanding wasn't the best match against Dimitrov, but I think Indian Wells is the, is the really going to be the key takeaway for him as he heads to clay. Expect him to have a pretty good summer and hopefully even get even better than he has been. I want that on record. I'm probably going to be wrong, but my bold claim is that, that Alcaraz will win more Indian Wells tournaments than any other tournament when his career is done. It could be true, and I think Iga could be saying the same thing, except for Roland Garros, right? Like, yeah, those, that's what those, two are, those two might be sharing the podium for many years to come with the, at Indian Wells. I think I got to go RG for Iga, but no, Indian yeah, Wells is not there for you. It's perfect. Yeah, but, um, but I think with Carlos, I think he's got the swagger back, and I think he's playing with that freedom to just be bold out there, be courageous, and play a little bit more instinct, a little get out, get out of his head. And of course, have Juan Carlos there by his side. I think that, that was missing a little bit in Australia. Um, so I think not much to worry about 20 years old couple slams under the belt i think we're going to hear from him a little bit more absolutely well more with chris otto here on tennis channel inside in talking miami open into the spring and summer clay court seasons that are on deck now but on the women's side in miami it was all about the danimal danielle collins finding a way outside the top 50 her, her unofficial last dance she said this is going to be it uh I think it's it's easy to understand why people are questioning it because she just won the biggest title of her life. But Danielle Collins going from outside the top 50, beating champions, beating major champions, finding a way to do it. And it's all about that relentless competitiveness, Chris, that she has. She is as ferocious as they come. We saw it again today or yesterday as we record this, winning a clay court match two days later. <laughs> whatever the stakes, whatever the round, whatever the event, Chris, you know she's going to fight. She's not afraid. And how she was hitting the ball, how she was returning serve, that Rabak in a match, how she neutralized probably the best serve in women's tennis. Yeah. She took the title in her home state. It was a very special moment and one very deserved for someone that puts the work in. Yeah, she's ferocious, right? I mean, saving 10 out of 11 break points in that final against Rabak and I just totally clutched, dealt with the pressure so well. But I think with with Danimal, I think it's maybe seen that there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. That her decision to retire, I think, has really helped her maybe maybe handle the physical issues she's had in her career and not see them as some kind of a long-term thing that she's suffering. Instead of it, maybe she sees the finish line now. She knows that yeah. there's a timeline on what she's doing. She's probably playing in a lot of pain, and she always has been, but it probably doesn't seem as bad to her because she knows, hey, this is my last dance. There's something emotional that's taking over and she's playing uh, she's playing freaking remarkable how well she's playing the first strike tennis how yeah. how clean she's been hitting the ball both wings everything she's been doing out there i think she she feels like um she doesn't have i don't think she's worrying about her body i think that right. really does play into her success that she's been capable of it all this time take out those worries take out those fears yeah. leave it all in the court and that's how good she can be how clean she rips, not just returns, but anything off Every of the rack is, is incredible. And, you know, her nature has always been, I'm going to play my game. There is a underrated or underappreciated side of that where break point down, you know, game point, match point, championship point. She's going to go for her shot. She might not always make it, but you don't have to worry about, as you would other athletes, maybe being timid in the moment. The moment has never been too big for her. 
I agree with you 100% on that other point, too. The fact that she sees the finish line, she's not freaking out that it's about to be over. She is definitely playing with a reassured calmness that, okay, I know this is it. I'm going to enjoy these moments. I'm very good at tennis still. Yeah. I'm going to put my best foot forward and take it one moment at a time. I think it sounds backwards because for a lot of athletes, it would be. But knowing that this is it has really freed her mind in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the endometriosis, the um, rheumatoid arthritis, the inflammation issues, the constant injuries, I think, have taken a toll on her mentally and spiritually throughout the course. And I think if she's, if she's looking at a longer career, it's like there's no end to this. It's hard to stay positive. And now she's just in this such a good place. I mean, you see it every interview she gives, every press conference, everything that comes out of her mouth is so positive. Her dog's hanging out with her. She's just smiling and just like, she's feeling a lot of love from people too. And I think all these elements are helping her. And I, I maybe that's the best we're going to see from her. But still, I'm looking forward to the next five or six months, US Open, who knows where she might strike mm -hmm. again. Because when she gets in Rome, man, she can be so lethal. I love that. I don't know if you saw what she said today after she won her match, which still is, is really impressive that she went from hard court final to, you know, the, the adrenaline drop. And then you got to go play on a completely different service and then yeah. she wins. Uh, but she said, look, I'm not, I wasn't used to traveling with a lot of people. So now this is more normal, just traveling by myself. So <laughs> she is back to normal by herself as the lone wolf. But there's yeah. also that side of it too, right, Chris, that she's, you know, she's ferocious out there, but she's a really nice, really kind person. We saw her look out for a per for a ball or a lines person, I believe, that fainted. So yeah, you know, she was you know there isn't she can turn it on and off, and she has a lot of friends in the game, and they were all happy for her too. That's always nice to see the USA tennis girls and tennis players in general are yep. all happy to see her have her moment. Yeah, big love from Serena, and that you know that meant a lot as well on out on uh, on social media. So yeah, I mean, great story. One of the biggest, most pleasant surprises of the uh, the Sunshine Double for sure. For Elena Rabakina, obviously, you have that many break points. You don't capitalize them in a final, on them in a final. It's going to leave a bitter taste in your mouth. But this was a good run, a, a brutal, a couple brutal match wins where she survived Sakari and Azarenka in some heavy, heavy, long matches. But yeah. I think it's going to be a good sign for her two straight trips to this tournament final. And in this case, Chris, coming off of an injury, the, the stomach issue that she had, that she could pick up right where she left off and play top five tennis. She's tough. She's very mentally tough. I, mean, I think it was eight days without even leaving her hotel or whatever. She, people that saw her in Indian Wells said she looked like a ghost, right? So the recovery, the fact that she battled through so many hard matches, probably not playing at her best, says a lot about where she's at. Also great on any surface. I expect her to be trouble on the clay. Wimbledon could win another slam this year for sure. Definitely up there, like, you know. I expect I expect her to be causing a lot of trouble for top players for the for the remainder of the season and for for the foreseeable future. Let's say she disguises that serve so well too. It's not just pace; it's just how she disguises it. And I, selfishly or just you know privately, I, I love the running forehand. Yeah, how she just doesn't look like the most conventional, but how she just kind of uses her large frame to just get a lot of torque on it and slide her feet over. It's it's fun to watch. Clay, you mentioned it. I mean, you wouldn't think Clay normally, but she beat Egon Clay last year, so she knows what she's doing on that surface. Yeah, she gets around the court remarkably well for her size. Probably an underrated mover. You know, probably the best server in the game at the moment. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of things going for her, for sure. Do you have any thoughts on our other semifinalist? You had uh, Azarenka, another deep run, talking about a warrior that just finds a way to just battle and fight out there. And then Alexandrova, who, you know, it didn't end well in the semis, but with that win that she had with, you know, beating Iga, beating Pagula, now has wins over every single top 10 player. So, Yeah, she's got a lot of big wins, right? She played some pretty flawless tennis against Iga. Pagula was a great win. She's, she just crushes the ball. My goodness, right? I mean, so, you know, she can strike at any time. I mean, the more confidence she has in her abilities to do well in big tournaments, the, the more damage she can possibly do. Still only 29, relatively young. And Vika... I count her out every once in a while. I sort of like, I don't count her out, but I sort of forget about her as a factor. And then she surprises me. And, and, and I think she's 34 now. So we, we have to appreciate her while we can right now. Still an incredible talent and a great personality. Always love to see her have success. Yeah. So she still learns and is trying to improve as a tennis player and still has the game. Keep it going for at least a little while longer. Well, yeah. Uh, Chris Otto from tennis now here, her on tennis channel insight. And I did want to, you know, wind this podcast down talking about the current events. We have clay court tennis in the United States for this week. 
Yeah. You know, the women are in Charleston, the men are in Houston. Uh, that WT event in Charleston, a lot of history in that city, in that event. Also, Chris, just interesting to see tennis on green clay on that hard true in this country. Yeah, I like the hard true. I like playing on it personally. I think it's it gets a bad rap. Red clay, obviously, much better. It's yeah. different vibe, different different playability, of course, too. But yeah, that tournament is a classic. Houston is also really cool at, at River Oaks Country Club, and it's a great chance to see a lot of American players. They've got a pretty good field this year. Francis, defending champ. And by the way, just a quick thing about the Americans and the men. I mean. Still liking that there's 12 in the top 100. Still liking that there's five in the top 25. I still see a glaring hole in the top 10. I think it's, mm. given how excited we were about the American men for the last maybe 18 months, I think yeah. there's got to be a guy in that top 10. And I feel like right now, Paul, Fritz, and Shelton are the guys who are maybe pushing. And I just want to see a little more from them. I think they've, they've got what it takes. But it's, uh, it's a little bit yeah. disappointing that we don't have one there right now. Yeah, unfortunately, Chris Eubanks lost his first round match to uh, Rinky, H H Rinky uh, Hijikata. It was his first clay win for Rinky on tour, and he wrote Dirt Baller on the camera, which I thought was funny. <laughs> I'm sure um, Eubanks yeah. loved that. Yeah, well, hey, yeah, to the victor goes the spoils, right? But, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. I think the, the tough part is Paul was trending that way. You wonder what would have been, and then gets injured, so that's just a brutal break for him. Fritz, we'll see. You know, Clay was surprisingly well last year. Can he keep that going? This is a big stretch in Francis Tiafo's career. I think we'd agree on that. Like, he won this title last year, hasn't yeah. been playing well. He wants to get back in the top 20 and then top 10. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to start winning. He's going to have to start winning now. Yeah, I mean, you knew it was going to be tricky once he parted ways with Wayne Ferreira, who had so much success. Those guys collaborated on, on just, uh, you know, the growth of Francis was obvious for those three years. Um, Diego Moyano steps in. It's definitely a new situation. I think there's a big adjustment period, and we're seeing that. That's why Francis is seven and seven right now. And I don't think he travels really well when he gets over. You know, the European clay is definitely not his hot spot. So I think Houston would be a good chance for him to change the momentum, and hopefully he can have a positive swing and, you know, at least come back to the U.S. with some momentum. We know he's got the game. It's just a little bit yeah. of a transition period that's taken a little longer than we'd like, I guess, with the new coach. You got Ben Shelton as the top seed, which is interesting, right? He's the number one seed at a tournament. We, we expect and we hope it's not going to be the last time. A chance for him to have some results on clay, maybe be the American to step up. Um, he's been, look, they're, they're, the signs are there, right, Chris? Like you watch him play, there's exciting flashes. I think it's also fair to say that he's a little raw in certain areas. So this is a big stretch in his young career, too. Yeah, I think he doesn't have that many points to defend from now until the U.S. Open. So a chance really realistically for him to get in the top 10. I like the way he's been playing this season. Tough losses like Manorino, third round, Australian Open. Um, gave Sinner a pretty good run for his money at Indian Wells. I mean, he's been playing some good tennis. He's got a great attitude on court. He just like exudes this positivity. His serve is so world class. I think he's one of the most exciting players to watch in the men's game today. But yeah, he's raw. He's not great on the return side. He's got to work on his shot tolerance, his ground game a little bit. And those are all coming along. And I think as they do continue to come along, I expect to see him as top 10 and maybe the top American. Could very well be the case. Uh, just know that last year, the ATP Houston event, they almost got rained out completely. So they had to play double duty on Saturday and Sunday to get it in. So we're, we're off to a better start there. Uh, the, the women's event in Charleston, Chris, has a, a, a healthy field. Uh, we got a big match coming up as we record this that everyone listening will already know the answer to Pagula and Annie Samova, who's looked good. Yeah. But there's some good seeds in this one. Sakari, Anj, Shabor, uh, Jess Pagula, who I mentioned, Kazakina, some other names as well. Anybody standing out or you think this could be a time to make a move of the Charleston field? Well, Navarro is definitely a name that comes to mind. He made a huge impression on all of us at Indian Wells. The way she played there was fantastic. The way she handled the media and we got to know her a lot better. That was a really a, a big spotlight moment for her. I expect big things from her. She's incredibly fit and ferocious mover around the court. Got a real yeah. solid all-around game. I think it's uh, that tournament is owned by her father. That's a little bit of a weird side <laughs> story. It doesn't mean she has, has a right to have success in it. But I feel like in the future, that's going to be one that she'll want to do well in. And maybe it'll be this year. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't pro wrestling. This is still a fair competition. Just pointing that out there, too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, Collins, as we mentioned, if she keeps it rolling, uh, a good opportunity for her to do that. On the men's side, outside of the States, we've got tournaments. We've got, we've got yeah. events everywhere. We're in that part where we all separate and go our separate ways. But Esterol and uh, Marrakesh in Morocco, 
some big events there. I did want to ask you about uh, one player in particular, Nesterol, Chris, and that's Dominic team. He's playing through what he says is wrist injury. Um, it's an unfortunate situation. It's also a weird one. He says that there's some clicking in his wrist, but he wins his first match, has Gath Day coming up. But I don't know if I can remember a situation where a player has been as upfront about not a great medical situation, but what do you think about Dominic team going into this week? And, you know, again, with the thing, with the thought process and the qualifier that he said was, if I'm not top 100 at the end of this year, I'm probably not going to keep playing. Well, I'm scared. I mean, it's such, it's such like a dramatic turn from where he used to be to before his wrist injury to where he is now. I expected this guy to win multiple Roland Garros talent uh, t- titles. And it's so unfortunate how it's, happened and what's going on with him and and like you know like he said in his recent instagram post that he was started working with his dad again started going back to his old practice regiment working extremely hard which he's been known to do in the past and then he overworks the wrist as and as a result and so you're just nothing but scared and hope just hope that he can get past this somehow and return to the form he's had i just as time goes on, it's harder and harder to imagine, but I sure hope that he can. He's, he's just, he's trying so hard and I hope that he actually gives it more time than just the year. Cause obviously it's, he just needs to get, yeah. get past something mentally or physically that he's going through. I don't really know, but it's unfortunate and uh, fingers crossed that he can find it yeah. again. Another setback, as he said, it's just, you hate to hear those words. And also, you know how brutal tennis is, especially the men's game now and how physical it is that you can't really be playing with any governors or restrictors on there. Yeah. These players are too good. The competition's too good. If there's any doubt, if there's any physical hampering, we're seeing it with Rafael Nadal in a way, one of the greatest of all time, that if you're not able to fully go, it could be tough sledding. So we wish Dominic team the absolute best to yeah. see how his progress goes. Uh, in Morocco, <laughs> so where we went for Matteo Berrettini and Stan Vavrenka. I grouped those two veterans together. Funny, right? Berrettini, yeah, I know. Stan looked awesome. Saw the highlights of his match. He looked very good as he winds down his career. Stan almost pushing 40. And then Crazy. Berrettini. Berrettini beat Shevchenko in straight sets and looked pretty good doing that as well. So they both two, veterans, two veterans at different points in their career, Chris. But I'd like to see the bounce back from those two guys. No, big age difference between those two. But yeah, Stan at 39, I think he's now 9-0 and against Ramos Vignola. So, you know, like a match that he expected to win, comes out confident. You're always rooting for him. He's, he's just he's just a legend. He's at Stanimal, right? And Berrettini, same thing. There's something about him, the way he plays the game, the way he is as a person, the talent that we know he has. I keep looking at his ranking and yeah. see that his career high was six. I always think it was a little bit higher. But, I, you know, I'd love to see him put those injuries behind him and kind of get back to a good run here and maybe use the inspiration that Yannick Sinner has given all these Italians. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, this boom. And Ben Paolini winning. It's the Italian, uh, you know, Paolini winning in Dubai. Yeah. Berrettini looked really well in that, in the best challenger of the year by far, the Phoenix challenger, uh-huh. making that run all the way through to the final. So it was good to see that uh, first stand. And I made this joke before you might appreciate this. I, I do say this in somewhat jest, but if Grand Slam titles were like appreciating assets, then in like 40 years, his three should be with like eight versus who he had to be to do it. No doubt about it. Total legend, man. I mean, Go with, yeah. I mean, at 39, it's so much to ask, but he's out there and he's got a lot of passion for it. I mean, even after today's win, you probably saw it. He's out there mm-hmm. hamming it up with the crowd and just loving every minute of it. So God bless him and keep, keep going and keep that ranking high so we can see more of you, Stan. Well, I have two quick things for you, Chris Otto, on Tennis Channel Inside. And before we wrap up, uh, two all-time greats again, two quick thoughts here. One being, do you have a read or just kind of reaction to the Novak Djokovic coaching situation now? And I know nothing official has been announced. We'll see. There's rumblings out there. But we all know how serious this you know, move is and how tough it might be to coach the greatest of all time. So I wonder what your thought is to Novak going coaching change, making that decision at this point in the game. Yeah. First off, I don't understand why the decision was made, but, but I, what I want to believe is that Novak is looking for something, wants a change, had a, had a long productive five years with Ivanisevic and just thinks that there's something else out there that can help him get over this little mini hump that he's got. Cause starting the year without winning an Australian open title for Djokovic is a little bit of a travesty, right? He's not used to the that. Titles in, titles in April. Where, what are, yeah. What's what going are we on? So, yeah. I mean, approaching 37, he'll be 37 before uh, main draw play at Roland Garros starts. Uh, he's just maybe, I believe that he's looking for something, wants to find it. And then add Zimanich will be with him at Monte Carlo. 
get a clean slate at the clay season. And maybe that's what, I guess that's what he feels he needs. So you got to look at it and think, never count this guy out. I still think he's probably got a slam in him this season. Maybe not multiple, but I'd be curious to see how that works out. Yeah, I think I agree with what you just said. I would only add that I think he also knows the clock is ticking because Sinner and Alcaraz are getting better yep. and better and better. And there's other guys coming. We might not know exactly who they are. Will Holger take that leap? You know, I know they're practicing together, Monte Carlo, and, and doing their stretches together. But there's always somebody else out there that's coming. So I think he knows not only does he want to fix his slump, Chris, but he also knows that this isn't going to last much longer. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think he's realizing that more than ever with the, the, uh, what's been happening in the, just these first three months of the season. Last thing I have wider notes, but, uh, can you think of a better commencement speaker than Roger Federer? who's going to speak at the Dartmouth convention. Uh, I got to imagine that that might be the most attended. It's going to be one that people don't blow off in the pretty, Ivy leagues. It's pretty cool. I think he'll be, I think Federer will have to get a little bit out of his league to do it. I think, I know he's going to crush it. Of course we all yeah. know that, but I think it's a little bit of a different challenge for him. I'm yeah. excited to see how it turns out. Very cool, right? It's very cool. It's exciting stuff. Uh, Chris Otto, you can find his stuff on tennis now also on Twitter at the fan child, anything uh, on your end upcoming, any, you know, you don't, you can just like tease us lightly, but you know, any pieces or any, things you're going to be monitoring or places you're going to be going to cover the game. Uh, I'll be at RG next working for yeah. RG.com. And the biggest piece I'm working on at the moment is a, a little bit of a career retrospective of Darren Cahill, which will be in, I think the U S open program. So that would be a cool one. I'm excited to talk to some people about the Darren Cahill effect. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a big one. So I, I can't wait to read that. Uh, Chris Otto, always one of the best guests here on tennis channel inside. It's a pleasure chat in the game learning some stuff about this sport of tennis thank you for joining tennis channel inside in appreciate having you on the podcast thanks for having me mitch take care